I'm Karen Taylor. I am the Programme Director of the General Society and on behalf of the General Society, I'm delighted to welcome you here this evening. And just for some of you who may not have been here before, a very brief synopsis of the General Society. Uh, the Society was founded as an, uh, it's a non-profit organization and was founded in 1785 by the schools craftsmen of the city. And today this 228 organization continued its tradition of serving and improving the quality of the life of people of the city of New York. And three of our programs include this lecture series, um, it, our Tuition Free Mechanics Institute and the General Society Library, which of course you are now in. Uh, tonight's uh, lecture continues that distinguished tradition of lectures, a lecture series that in fact has been going on for nearly 200 years. And this is one of five labor lectures that will provide a behind the scenes look at the creative industries in New York City. And this of course is the first. This series has been curated by Beverly Miller, uh, president of the local United Scenic Artists, uh, 829. And I want to thank Bev so much and indeed the participating artists. So before introducing Bev, who's going to say a few words about USA uh, 829 and tonight's speaker, Inbol Weinberg, and also to tell you the story really about why we're all here this evening and it's all due to Inbol. So I'm very, very <laughs> pleased to introduce to you uh, Beverly Miller. Thank you, Karen, and good evening. I'm very pleased to be here uh, introducing Inbal and kicking off the series. Uh, United Scenic Artists is a labor union. We represent designers and artists in the entertainment industry in New York, and we're over 100 years old. Uh, we represent folks who work in television and film, in live theater, opera, ballet, we have a jurisdiction that's national, national for live theater and five states for television and film. And we're uh, very proud of the people who work in our local union. We represent over 4,000 people in an industry that has served New York, especially in the past couple of years, as a great financial engine and a serious, now taken very seriously, as an industry in this city. Um, Inbal introduced me to the folks here at the General Society when she was working on a film called The Angriest Man in Brooklyn, which is yet to be released. And she said, you know, I'm right in the neighborhood and you have to see this place. So I came up here and I was just overwhelmed at the beauty of this building and the history that's encompassed here. And we got to meet Victoria and Karen and talked about our mutual interests in craft and the trades in New York. And this is one of the things that has grown out of it. We've also combined some, uh, some training prospects and hoping to work together in the future as we are with the lecture series. And um, I just want to say, as far as Inbal is concerned, I met her way back in 2009 on one of her first movies in the city called Blue Valentine and just have followed her career and I'm very excited about what she's been doing and what she will be doing. And I think you're very lucky to be able to hear her this evening. So enjoy the lecture and thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hi everyone. So my name is Enbal Weinberg. I'm a production designer and I'm here to launch the Day in the Life of lecture series. I want to thank the society for inviting me. As you already heard, I sort of stumbled upon this place when I was scouting for a film called The Angriest Man in Brooklyn, starring Robin Williams, who plays a lawyer. And our location scout brought us here to see the upstairs offices. And it was just such a beautiful building. And once I learned a little more about the society, I was really impressed and kind of felt like, oh, it's the continuation of labor in the city, and so I invited Beverly, and I thought, what a great place to be a part of. So it's my pleasure to be here, and thank you so much. Um, okay, so this 
lecture is hopefully going to be able to explain a little more about my profession and the industry that I work in. Um, I always notice that people always tell me that they watch a film and then there is a very long list of credits at the end and it's very confusing to know what these people are actually doing. So hopefully I'll be able to demystify a little bit this long list and tell you about um, the art department and the production designer, uh, which is a very diverse and kind of complex role. So I thought that we should start with the definition. Um, so production designer is sort of in charge of the overall look of a film. Through very um, close collaboration with the director and the director of photography, uh, they come together with a certain vision, a sort of aesthetics of um, a film, the look and the feel of a movie. And of course, there is the practical part to it, which is how do you bring the concept, the images to fruitation through construction, through set dressing, and so forth. Um, a little bit of history about the production design world. Um, the first films, like right at the beginning of cinema, at the turn of a century, um, had very flat sets. As you can see, most of them were even painted as a backdrop or just, just flats in the back of characters. This was kind of because they're still uh, figuring out the medium and the camera wasn't able to move. And I think the reference point was always theater where it's just proscenium and you see everything straight on. So the, the sets right at the first few years of cinema were very rudimentary. But very early on in the next couple of decades, there was a pretty vast evolution of production design and it went all the way to these epic films. This one is called Intolerance, is made by D.W. Griffith, which is one of the first auteurs in American film. And I think it's from 1925, and you can see the crazy scale of this um, model um, of ancient Egypt. And then, of course, there was a more experimental side in European film. For example, this film called uh, The Cabinet of Dr. Caligari, which is also from the 20s, from Germany where the sets were a lot more expressive and kind of fantastical in a way, sort of mirroring the, um, the feel of the dark movie and the characters in the story. And of course, there are also sci-fi elements. This is Metropolis by Fritz Lang, and it's also this uh, same era, the 20s. And you can see these very large constructions that were kind of about a future state. Um, so, as I said, this was kind of in the first decades of cinema. So, at the beginning, there wasn't really an art department. They used to contract people from the outside, like builders, to come build these things. But with time, especially with the Hollywood studios, um, they, uh, the studios themselves realized that it would be a lot more cost-effective and streamlined if they had in-house departments. So, um, this is sort of the golden age of American film in the Hollywood era. You had these big art departments that were in-house for each studio, like MGM, Paramount, had their own art departments, and there would be one supervising art director who was kind of like more of a chair, like an administrative position, and would supervise all the different um, parts like the builders, the model makers, the matte painters, and his name would go on as art director for every film that would come out of the studio. But it was a bit of a controversial time because some of these people were not really that involved because there's so much coming out. But because there would be one name kind of for each film and every studio had their own style in the 20s and 30s, these uh, art directors became a little more famous and the position of art director became more well known. For example, um, for example, Van S. Polgase, who designed all of the Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers um, musicals in the 30s and his style was very um, pronounced. It's kind of, um, and this is Cedric Gibbons, who was I think almost like a, 
a rock star. Like he married a film star and he was always like driving around in his whatever fancy car. And his name was on a lot of films that came out of the studio at the time, but he had a gigantic team. And also working for the studio, you have vast resources because there's really huge prop houses. They recycle a lot of sets. They have back lots. Um, but most of the work at the time was done in the studios. So the studios would have these big back lots with like the New York Street or whatever, uh, or they would recycle the same sets but change things around. And a lot of the work was done inside. Um, this man, his name is William Cameron Menzies, uh, was another very well-known supervising art director. He worked for MGM. And he's actually responsible for the term production designer. He worked on Gone with the Wind with David O. Selznick. And he was so involved in the design, he did a ton of, um, as you can see at the time, it was today not used as much. But at the time, they used to do a lot of architectural sketching. And so in a way, he was almost inventing the look because whatever sketch he would do would end up very similar. Um, this is David O. Selznick. And so these are the kind of sketches that he would do for Gone with the Wind. And I think he went as far as actually constructing shot lists and almost storyboarding the film. So David O. Selznick let him be called up the production designer of the film. And this is the first time that the term production design was actually used in 1939. Um, so then we come to first, uh, Second World War, and after the war, there was a bit of a different era that started. The studios started their very slow, I wouldn't say demise, but the golden era was kind of getting lost a little bit too, obviously, the post-war um, effects and also the beginning of television. And at the same time in Europe, there were some very interesting productions going on with kind of uh, bare looks. People were shooting on the street. This is a film from Italy that was using the post-war era, the, the rubble. Um, so some American filmmakers were also influenced by that look. And starting around that time, in the 50s and definitely afterwards, we start seeing a lot more location work which was originally very difficult technically because the cameras would be very big, it would be too loud, you would need gigantic lights. But with time and technology getting better, it became easier to go out on the street. As we can see in On the Waterfront, which was from 1954 and was one of the first films that was shot almost completely on location. It's supposed to be in New York, but it was shot in Hoboken. Uh, and some of New York, and there's a lot of shots outside on the piers using non-actors on the, on the roofs. And this, this film actually won the Academy Award for production design, which was kind of an interesting gesture at the time because it was an acceptance of a more realistic look. So from then on, we kind of have these two schools um, that have stayed until today and often get mixed. The more you know, grand epic design and the more, I would say, realistic or authentic design. Um, we still, of course, had huge sets being constructed. This is the set for Rear Window, Hitchcock's Rear Window, uh, which you can see is so involved. And I'm sure that they couldn't have shot it a different way, the film, because it really involves so much interior architecture. Um, Another, this is um, scenes from Vertigo. So you can see that the kind of traditional way of rendering sets that is very, um, of course, time consuming and, and laborious was still happening and still happens today. This is another well-known designer. His name is Ken Adam and he did Dr. Strangelove and Dr. No as well. You, you saw his um, rendering at the beginning of the uh, um, the first slide. So these really big sets were still being constructed and still to today, this is Dante Ferretti who is one of the, uh, maybe the most well-known production designer of our time. He worked with Fellini, he's worked with, I think he's done most of Martin Scorsese's films. There's I think still ongoing an exhibition of his work at MoMA right now and they're also showing a lot of the films he's designed. 
Um, so he, his work is extremely epic. He builds whole cities, like he built New York in the 1800s for Gangs of New York and so on. Um, so that's one of the, the schools. And then the other one is, this is um, one of his renderings for the aviator. He like, makes these gigantic paintings that um, the rest of the department works from. Um, the other school is kind of, which got uh, uh, more popular in the 70s, is the sort of more gritty, like, urban feel of the city. This is the French Connection, which was also shot in New York. A lot of very famous street scenes that were very much as is. I mean, you always have to control the environment, but in terms of the background, the cars, the street furniture, it's all very authentic. So another version of that is Taxi Driver. You know, it's, um, you can see that very urban, authentic, kind of about the fringes of society. And till today, there's still that, um, it is expressed a lot in independent film, where you can see more gritty, authentic exteriors and interiors. Um, this is from All the President's Men, also from the 70s, where most of the action takes place in this gigantic office. It's really just an office that looks exactly like probably what the Washington Post looked like at the time. Um, so another still that's similar to that is from a film that came out, I think, two years ago called Tinker Taylor, um, Soldier Spy, which was also very realistic for the time. It's a period piece, but I just thought it kind of mimicked a little bit. It's sort of, you're not trying to make things too glamorous. And this still is from Synecdoche, New York which is uh, designed by Mark Friedberg, who's also a very big production designer. And this is an interesting mix. I mean, you can see that the set is designed, but you sort of also see the day-to-day -day of this character. Um, and I think you can even see that in this week's Academy Award nominees, because, you know, The Great Gatsby was nominated for production design, which is a very epic film but also a film like Her was nominated, which is you know, more of a conceptual design and a lot closer to real life or what real life would look like in this parallel universe. Um, and so today we're sort of always dealing with both epic and gritty. Like most films have uh, similar, you know, maybe 50% locations. Sometimes you go to locations and you do nothing in them and sometimes you completely take over. Um, the entire house, or you construct m imaginary sets. So there's always a combination of these things. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit about the art department and my own background, just so you have a bit of a context. Um, I went to NYU Film School knowing that I wanted to be a production designer, and I started working on student films when I was in school. And I think my passion was always independent films, which means films that are outside of the Hollywood world. They're usually financed independently and have more unconventional storylines. Uh, a lot of times they're made for a lot less money and so there's less resources and definitely less crews. So when you start in that world, you sort of learn to do every kind of position and you're trying to get resources from wherever. It's a lot of like troubleshooting and trying to figure out how to do things that you don't really have the money to do. So that was the world that I started out in. And of course, like with time, you know, your s films become a little bigger and I got into the union. So working on union films is a definitely a different thing and the system is a lot more fixed and there's a way of doing things because when you're working on a huge film that has hundreds of people as crew, you definitely need a system. And so I learned a little bit the system that is the union way of doing things, but I could say that I'm always kind of doing things in an indie manner as well and still working on some independent films. Um, so to explain a little bit about the process and what the art department is, when I get a script, I read it, I have some initial images, I go to the meeting with the director, and I present my images in whatever way, some sort of presentation, and then if the director kind of feels like I got the idea behind the movie, 
then he hires me and then I start the job. And the beginning and actually throughout the whole film, the most important collaboration is with the director. Really, I have to understand exactly what he's thinking in his mind and I have to translate it into reality. So we have to be absolutely on the same page. And that involves a lot of back and forth, a lot of conversations, emails, a lot of references between us. Um, the beginning stage is always research. Sometimes you're working on a period piece and you need to actually research to know, you know, what people drove in the 70s, what did people eat in the 1800s. And then there's also research into characters, like what is this character, what is their house going to look like. And, you know, at times I even talk to actors to ask them, what do you think this character would listen to, what kind of books they would read. So there is that initial period. Same time I'm trying to get my crew together because the most important thing is always to have the best crew. So that takes a while usually. And then once that very initial period is over, we start doing location scouting, which is basically the director, the director of photography, the production designer, and the location manager or scout get in the car and we just drive around for days and days and days trying to find the perfect places. It's not just exteriors. It's interiors, it's, it's whatever the film calls for. And it's not easy to find the perfect place because there's a lot of times limitations. There's very specific things that you need from a place. There's also practical limitations, like how are we going to be able to bring 70 people into this small house? Or can we get the neighbor across the street to agree to let us put a huge, you know, there's so many different kinds of factors that you have to bring into the conversation. So it takes a while to find the right locations. Slowly, they all get locked. And as I get more information, as we know, OK, this is for sure going to be the supermarket we are going to shoot in, then I download the information to my crew, and then we go from there. So I'll tell you a little bit about the crew, which is the art department. The production designer is the head of the department, and then there are sort of like a tree. Um, I'll tell you about each position. Uh, the art department coordinator is sort of the secretary of the department or like a producer of the department. They're usually always in the office and they run everything that's going on because it's a very large department and there's a lot going on at all times. So there's people out getting things, there's different transportation, there are things coming in and going out. Um, so the art department coordinator does a lot of the administrative work, paperwork, and also communicating with, ve with vendors, monitoring the budget, um, and so on. The art department coordinator has assistants, the art department assistants. Uh, the art director is in charge of everything that is getting constructed um, in the movie. If, for example, we're building a huge set on a stage, the art director is going to be drafting that set or hiring draftspeople. Um, he's going to be hiring a construction coordinator, and the construction coordinator is going to be hiring carpenters to build the set. And then he's also going to be hiring a charge scenic, which is the head of the scenic department. And the charge scenic brings in a whole team of painters, and then they paint the sets. There is also a graphic designer that does all of the signage or any kind of graphic work that we need for the film. So that's usually all under the art director. The set decorator is like an interior decorator. Whenever the art director builds the set, the set decorator needs to sort of fill it. Or if we go into an empty house, then the set decorator has to take care of everything inside. And the set decorator has assistants who go out shopping or coordinating with prop houses and has a lead man who is kind of the foreman and has, that has a swing gang or set dressers. And the set dressers are basically like movers. They do everything in the house. Let's say we go into an empty house. They bring all the furniture in. They put up shelves. They put up the curtains. They tile. So it's, um, it's always a big job of making a place a home, let's say, if it is actually a house. Um, they also do a lot of exterior work. And who um, the last part of exterior work usually is greens. It's kind of the landscapers. Uh, any kind of special 
greenery that needs to be brought or if you have change of seasons or if there's a particular a particular plant that has to be planted, then you have a special team that only does the landscaping. Um, and the last one is Prop Master. Prop Master is in charge of everything that the actors touch. So that goes from their personal props, like an actor's watch or sunglasses, to whatever they eat uh, or drink or what they drive. Uh, it's a very meticulous job because it has to be all very um, precise and it involves a lot of different things. Like if you have a shootout, the prop master will take care of all the guns or of course all the cars. And if you have a big dinner scenes, then they always have to make sure that they have enough food for everyone. Ev after every take, they have to reset all the food. So they're always on set making sure that the actors are comfortable, that everybody has everything they need. And they have assistance. So that's pretty much the department, and the size of the department varies depending on the, how big the film is. On, on small independent films, you could possibly only have the four people, but on big films, you can have hundreds and hundreds of people. Like you could have one day with, you know, 50 carpenters and 50 painters, or even more, depending on how epic your film is. Um, let's see. I think I kind of mentioned the process in general, and so I, I'm gonna talk about three different sort of case studies from films that I worked on. I'll start with my last film, which is called St. Vincent, and I'll tell you a little bit about it because it hasn't come out yet. Um, it stars Bill Murray as this uh, very cantankerous, old, mean man that is sort of given up on life and lives in a sad house that has not changed since the 70s that no one's taken care of for like a few decades. Um, and the story is that a single mom with her young kid moves in next door to him and he sort of develops this relationship with the kid involuntarily, like it doesn't start out well, but then the kid sort of get, you know, becomes a part of Bill's character's life, and it's about their friendship and the general way that Bill's character changes through it. So the first scene, as you can see, this is a part of the script, a, um, exterior, Batch Elder Street, which is a street that we found, Sheepshead Bay, the story is about Sheepshead Bay, a street lined with near identical houses except one, a rundown dump, the blight among blights. Um, so from the first shot, we sort of have to establish the fact that Bill is, um, Bill's house is completely neglected and also that he's very different than the neighborhood. He's sort of the one guy no one really wants to talk to. So we got in the car when we traveled and we tried to find a place that would have a kind of uniform look. The story itself reads a little suburban, so it's not like you can go to Brownstone, Brooklyn and find this how it needed to be a very specific thing. So we traveled around for a while. We looked at a lot of different looking houses. And as I said, it's very hard to find the right thing. First of all, practically, the people in the house have to agree to be in a movie. And not just that, but the people in the house next door. Because this is a story of two families, and so we always had to have the relationship between the two houses. So one house had to look very dumpy, and one house just needed to look like, you know, a pretty new house that th this mom is just moving into. So every one of these houses was right in some way and not in the other way. And I'm going to mention another part that is very important is that the first scene in the film where they meet is that the mom, is, which is Melissa McCarthy, moves in next door and the moving truck knocks a, goes right into a tree limb of Bill's tree that has been there for a generation and then the tree limb falls on Bill's car and smashes the car. So it's like a very important first scene and we needed to have a tree that is going to be just in the right kind of area for the houses to have a tree limb fall on a car and also not be too overwhelming for the shot. So we had so many different kinds of limitations. We had needed to have the truck be able to pull up. We needed to have, you know, neighbors agree from all sides. So we spent a lot of time looking for the right 
house. Certain things you know you can change and certain things you know you can't. A lot of it went based on the tree, which is kind of funny to think about because it's very, very hard to fake a tree. You can do a lot more to a house. So in the end, we settled on, randomly, these two houses, which you can kind of barely tell the difference. The one on the right had older siding, and the one on the left looks definitely a bit newer, and you can't quite tell, but there is a tree that was kind of in the perfect position. But of course, we needed to do a lot to the house on the right, which was going to be Bill's house. So we started out saying, OK, we have to paint. The, ha the house is way too white, and it needs to look very shabby. So my graphic designer did a bit of a previs thing, and we um, photoshopped different, oh, that, sorry, I forgot. This is my um, little note on references. These are references that I saw around the neighborhood or that I picked out, like location scouting. It's hard to tell, but there's like some, you know, old looking fences and kind of run down because it needed to be so run down, you needed to have very good references for it, especially for the aging, which I'll explain in a sec. So my graphic designer did f basically photoshopped a lot of different kinds of colors to see what would look basically the, the saddest. So <laughs> we ended up going with um, the yellow on the left because it was sort of a bit out there, like you would definitely recognize the house, you would notice it among all the other houses on the street, and it is a color you don't actually ever want to paint your house in. Um, as you can see, we also added in the graphic design an awning, which was not there to begin with, because you know a lot of the older houses in that neighborhood have these older awnings, and so we fabricated one, and this one is non-existent, but then afterwards. This is our house while working on it. Actually, my charge scenic Rebecca is here in the audience, and she is um, standing on, on, I think, the ledge of the house over there painting, so she could also test later to how difficult it was to try to get it in the right place. But you can see here, we painted the top of the house, we also painted various parts of like under the, um, the roof on the first floor. We added the awning. And all of this, um, you can see that it looks very old, that it looks like you know it got rained on for decades. This is all the lovely work of my scenic team, and it takes a very long time to do properly. So they were working on that for a long time. You can see that we added the fence. The fence also had to be aged. And we did, um, well, we needed to have a sort of a very sad looking grass in the front to be very different than all the other manicured lawns. So we had our landscaping team come in and basically kill a bunch of plants. And it went through various stages of getting sadder and sadder because we just let them die until the first day of shooting. Um, I don't know if you can tell, but we also added some mullions to the windows so that the windows looked like they were older, um, uh, the design was older. And what's always hard about working on an existing structure is that sometimes you can't harm the structure, most times, because there's a family living there, and obviously they let us paint, knowing we're going to repaint afterwards, but certain elements are not... Um, we would not be able to bring back to the way it was. So what the scenics had to do with a lot of this is um, this interesting technique that I think I could explain better with these shots. It's hard to tell because they did such a great job, but these are all, um, all of the, the white stuff is actually not painted straight onto the, um, to the window sills or the mullions. They're painted on paper. It's um, kind of a sticky paper that they did all of their um, aging work on. And then the paper itself went on to the, to the windows so that in the end of the day, we could just basically scrape it all back and it would be back to normal. So 
this kind of um, work and especially getting the aging rights takes a long time and we had to go back and forth with the amount because it's hard to tell what is too much. You know, we had it to a certain point and then when the director came for the scout, when, he, when we were working, he came to see our progress, he said, you gotta go way bigger with it. Like it has to look a lot uh, more rundown which at that point we ended up taking a lot more out, like really big splotches of, um, of paint, like peeling and so on. Um, we also added, this is for, the scene, for certain scenes that were very important that you can see in the film, but we, we added um, the fence, as you can see it all looks like. It's just weeds. Um, and the mailbox, all of these things are aged, you know, they're all purchased new at like a hardware store and so the aging process takes a lot of time and also has to be done correctly, otherwise it just looks fake. Um, here, if you can see the guy that's on the fence, uh, the ladder, he's putting in a fake tree limb for the tree that is going to fall on the car. So he's a part of the Green's team and what they do is they find a real um, tree limb, but obviously it's not going to have the same oak leaves because the oak leaves are going to fall out. So all of these leaves on this tree are actually put in with wire. Um, and we had to attach it every time. We have a lot of shooting before and after. So every scene you have to make sure, oh, is this before the tree limb fell or after? And then you have to put it back up or down. It's hard to tell how it's put up, but it's basically is up with like bolts. And then the scenic had to paint it so that you don't see where, um, where it connects to the real tree. But worked out really well, actually, and it was a very funny scene when it fell on the car. Um, so I think this is the final, I think this shot is from really the day, the first day of shooting or so on and so forth. So you can tell the difference from the way it started out. Um, I will tell you a little bit about Blue Valentine as my second case study. Um, this is a bit of a different situation. You know, with films, a lot of times the look and also the, f the whole experience of the movie is dictated by the style of the director. And with Blue Valentine, Derek C. and France, the director had a very extensive background in documentary filmmaking. He had been making documentaries for 10 years, and he wrote this very personal story. I think it it took him about 11 years to get this film made, so it went through a lot of different stages, and a lot of it was taking, it was very autobiographical. And he just wanted to shoot this film like a documentary. So he had a lot of unconventional ideas that were very challenging at times, because when you're an experienced crew member, you're used to doing things a certain way. So. At times it was difficult to follow his intentions, but it was always extremely satisfying because it was very refreshing and innovative the way that he was thinking about things. So for example, let me just tell you a little bit about the film for people who haven't seen it. It's a story of a couple. It opens um, in current day and it's a, a young couple with a daughter and their relationship is sort of not really going right and they decide to take a, a romantic weekend at like a themed motel room. And this relationship story intercuts with the story of the couple's first meeting, their romantic time of courtship and how they all fell in love. Um, and it sort of follows that relationship in the past and also the relation relationship in the present. So for Dean and Cindy's house, which is Ryan Gosling and Michelle Williams, it's a very minute part of the script. Really, there's just a few scenes in it at the beginning of a movie where you're introduced to the characters and you understand their situation and then they decide to go away. Really, in the script itself, we didn't see the house that much. However, 
Derek wanted to construct the film in a way that their relationship is going to feel very, very realistic and that they're going to be like a family. So he fought very hard for this um, because it's really unconventional to do. Of course, he won. And what we did was we shot the entire first part where they all fall in love and they are young and they run around New York City. We shot all of that. And then the whole crew took a hiatus for a month. And during this month, Ryan and Michelle and their daughter basically lived in this house that we created for them. They would come in every day. Sometimes they stayed there, but most of the time they would come in and they would just live as a family. Like they would celebrate birthdays and they celebrated Christmas and they would make home movies and they would cook and they would buy groceries. And so this was more like a rehearsal period for them to really feel what a family feels and also what it's like to move from like a couple that just fell in love to being, you know, a married couple with responsibilities and so on. So for this house that we had to build, it had to basically function like a house, um, which is very different than the way you usually you usually do it like if sometimes I feel like films are a bit like when you walk in on a Hollywood back lot and you see this perfect New York City street but if you walk to the other side it's just flat and there's nothing in the back a lot of times we create things to look kind of transitory but they don't have to function this house had to function completely so we were making this film in Scranton Pennsylvania and we found a house that worked for us it was a ranch house it fit the family it kind of you know, lower middle class, they don't really have much, they don't have glamorous jobs. Um, and it was completely bare when we found it. And the thing is, it just had to work. It had to be super functional. Um, and it had to look authentic. This is a bit of uh, different references that I had while thinking about the house. It's a little hard to tell, but there's pictures from Derek's house. There's pictures from our director of photography's house. There's like some films that we loved, some places that we found while scouting. Um, and then I made a little, this floor plan is very um, kind of amateurish because it's a very small film where there barely was an art department. I didn't have an art director. Usually the drafting is like very, very, very um, meticulous and very detailed. This was just kind of for my crew, so we all knew what was gonna, what things were gonna look like. Um, and this is, uh, I love this photo. This is from the period where Michelle and Ryan and um, their daughter were living in the house. And so from a set dressing point, we had to make it like very realistic. So, you know, we got the furniture, we got the things for the kid, but we w had to go even further with it. Like every drawer that you would open in the kitchen would have things in it. Like if you open the, dr the closet underneath the sink, it would have cleaning supplies. I had to hook up the house to have Wi-Fi and we got them a Gmail account. And we, we, we actually had to get a phone line into the house. And I, and I still have Dean and Cindy's number in my phone. And this is all for fictional characters. You know, everything had to work. The TV, the record player, all the appliances had to be functional. Everything had to be, you know, the fridge had to be full. So it's very, very different than a set that you just construct for one day. The actors come, they leave, and everything else, you know, is gone. Um, there, here's some photos from this period when there was just, it was just them and Derek and um, the stills photographer would come in and take these pictures, but really they were just living life like a family. And actually it was a very funny time because I'm used to, I'm kind of used to being in complete charge and I wanted to come in and like clean the house like the house be became a mess no one was like picking up anything there you know we had like uh, dirty dishes in the sink and Derek was telling me no you can't touch anything this is exactly what happens to a family like they have to be fighting about who's going to clean up who's going to you know do the dishes like that's exactly the tensions that are going to arise from this situation um, 
Mr. Garner and Michelle after I think a pretty hard day of running around. I mean, they went fishing, they barbecued. Was, so in that way, it was a very um, unconventional experience because that's not usually how we work. And to be honest, in the film, you see the house for maybe a split second, like a few minutes at the beginning of the movie, which is something that production designers and art department crew members always have to be aware of, is that you work so hard and you dress so much, and at the end of the day, maybe you see a corner. But in this particular, um, uh, this particular instant, it was more for the actors. So in a way, it was an environment that you're building, not necessarily visual, but also emotional. Um, I think my last case study is from a film called The Perks of Being a Wallflower. Um, also a very interesting situation where the director sort of um, dictated the look of the film. This story is about a teenager growing up in um, Pittsburgh, the suburbs of Pittsburgh in the 90s, and it's kind of a coming of age story. It's about all of the uh, adventures and um, different things that happen to him as he's growing up and in high school. And it's based on a book. The book was written by Stephen Chbosky, who also directed the movie. And it was very much a personal story. So much so that we ended up shooting in his neighborhood, in places that he attended, you know, places where he grew up. And it was very, very important to him that it would be very authentic. In the first day of working, he came into the art department with this gigantic box of personal items, like from photos of himself and his family to like his own personal tape cassettes that he made mixes on and things that we almost recreated um, identically later for the main character. So it was a very interesting experience working with someone who was that close to the material because a lot of the times it was based on childhood memories and childhood memories are very hard to communicate. So it, it was, we, you know, we spent a lot of time trying to understand exactly what was in Steve's mind. Um, and he was also very emotionally connected to these landscapes. And for example, what I'm going to show you is a scene that we call the Luminaria, where it takes place around Christmas. Christmas is a big part of the story. That's when the main character's birthday is, and there's a kind of a trauma that has to do with that time in his life when he was a kid, a younger kid. Um, and we had to look for a perfect kind of suburban road because there was a very wide scene of Christmas and um, it had to show all these suburban homes and a road that goes through them. So of course we drove around, we drove around forever, and then Steve said, we should just go to my parents' house. So we ended up picking the road outside of Steve's parents' house, which I also had the key to, and whenever he would try to describe a prop to me that I would not understand, he would just be like, just go to my mom's house and take it, it's from the basement, you know? So that is also a very unconventional way of doing things, but you can see the road, it worked, it would, worked out perfectly for the kind of suburban landscape um, that we were looking for, and it had a sort of a rise at the end. But as you can tell, this is summertime, and we were shooting um, a gigantic scene that was gonna take place in winter. So that's when I uh, got to know a lot about season change, and we hired a special effects team that came in and gave us a very detailed tutorial about fake snow, which um, you can have a lot of different kinds of. And we had to basically make winter uh, in the summer setting. So there were a lot of conversations um, going on, mainly about the trees. There's um, various conversation about defoliating the trees, which is kind of heartbreaking because you can kill them. Um, we ended up putting camo nets on a lot of them, and luckily we had some evergreens as well. But you can see the team, and you can see the amount of work that it took for, I think, maybe two days. We were just spraying snow all over the place. And there's different kinds of snow. The snow on the ground is a different kind of fake snow than the snow on the trees. Um, and not only that, we had to place luminaria all through the big road, so we had many conversation about what exact lighting we're going to use. Should we use candles? 
Should we use actual light bulbs? So the whole thing took a long time to plan and set up, but you can see that it was, this is of course in daytime. Our scene was at night, which is also very helpful because at night you sort of have more control on what you're going to see. So we used a mix of different kinds of snow. The greens team also brought a lot of extra evergreen plants that we can place strategically wherever there was a, you know, an area that would look um, too summery. So this is us getting ready for the scene. Of course, my set dressing team dressed all the houses with Christmas lights, and the locations team had to get agreement from every neighbor in the street to let us use their house and the exterior of their house, which is usually very, very hard to do. But luckily, Steve was the son of the family, and they knew him since he was a baby, so everyone was, um, most everyone was really helpful and collaborative. Um, this is us shooting at night already. So you can kind of tell that certain things are more eliminated than others. It looks pretty good. And um, I have, the actual clip from the movie. This clip is very um, quick. There's other parts in the film where you see that scene. There's sound. Um, so as you can see, mm -hmm. um, so this is him kind of having this very important exchange with his um, aunt when he was a baby. It's all good. That's pretty much it. Yeah, so that is kind of my last um, image that I have to share with you. Thank you very much.